It's 664 AD, and it's quite the year for the British Isles. There's a solar eclipse at the beginning of May, followed by a major outbreak of the plague. And in the Kingdom of the Northumbrians, a debate takes place between the leading thinkers of the church, in the presence of royalty, about the correct method of determining the date of Easter. Now, it might be easy to wave away this debate as an overcomplicated academic squabble over a technicality, but Christianity in Saxon England was a more rugged affair than it is now, and the inhabitants of this world were rather closer than we are, on the whole, to the realities of life and death, and naturally more invested in the promised rewards or punishments for correctly or incorrectly performed faith. A dispute over the day on which Christianity's most important festival was to be celebrated will have had a result with possible consequences beyond this life. And also it's a good opportunity to enjoy some 7th century churchmen insulting each other. Hello, and welcome to the video. Today, we'll explore the Synod of Whitby. At this debate in 664 AD, the Northumbrians were faced with a choice between two methods for determining the date of Easter. Either that used by the Irish monks, who had founded a monastery on Iona in the Inner Hebrides, and subsequently spread their version of Christianity throughout much of northern Britain, or something more like the method used at Rome and elsewhere in Christendom. Our main source for the Synod is Bede, who wrote his ecclesiastical history of the English people in the early 8th century. Bede was a Northumbrian himself, and is likely in the later 7th century to have had access to testimony from people present at the Synod. There's also an account of the event in another work of the early 8th century, The Life of St. Wilfrith, by Stephen of Ripon, although this is much briefer than Bede's. When we get on to the debate itself, the direct quotations from speeches will all come from Bede, who evidently rather likes the opportunity to enjoy a bit of aggressive rhetoric. The gist of the two accounts is very similar, though. Bede may even have used Stephen's work. Both authors wrote in Latin, although as we'll see in a minute, the debate was held at least in part in Old English. It's obviously unlikely that Bede has given us a faithful word-for-word -word translation of everything that was said at the Synod, not least because it will surely have lasted longer than the 1300 or so words which he devotes to it. Presumably it will also have involved a good deal more technical discussion of the actual methods for determining the date of Easter than Bede gives us, but it's fun to think of these churchmen, almost 1400 years ago, sledging each other as Bede tells us they did. How did this debate come about in the first place, then? Well, the story starts with St Columba, an Irish abbot who founded the monastery on Iona and spread Christianity throughout Scotland in the 6th century. In 635, one of the monks of this monastery, Aidan, became the bishop of the Northumbrians, choosing the island of Lindisfarne as his seat. The Northumbrian royal family had strong links to the monastery on Iona, after a period of exile for several of its members to the monastery's sphere of influence, and so a bishop was requested from this Celtic church rather than from the south or from the continent. The method that the monks of Iona used for determining Easter's date was different from that used in southern Britain and beyond, and the new bishopric of Lindisfarne naturally favoured the Celtic method. We'll get into the nature of the difference in method in a minute. Now, not everyone in Northumbria was on board with the Celtic method, but Aidan's likeable personality and the respect in which he was held prevented any great trouble arising from the disagreement. Aidan's successor, Finnan, faced more opposition though. His loudest challenger was called Ronan, and he was actually Irish, but he had received his ecclesiastical education on the continent. The issue kept fermenting, and by now the king of Northumbria was Oswy. You'll see his name here spelled with a Y, but in Old English it ends with I-G. Old English G's are sometimes pronounced like consonantal Y's. In Bede, his name is Latinized to Oswiu. Oswiu was one of those who had been exiled to the north in his youth, along with his brother and predecessor on the throne, Oswald. And the two brothers favoured the Celtic method. Oswy even spoke Aidan's language. Now. Oswald isn't the churchman in this picture, he's actually the severed head. Oswald had been killed in battle by the pagan king, Pender of Mercia, who had cut off his head and other extremities and put them up on stakes, where they had reputedly performed miracles. The following year, Oswy reclaimed his brother's various body parts, and the head ended up buried at Lindisfarne. To Oswy, then, the consequences of faith were far more tangible than they may seem to a broadly secular world. 
the matter of Easter couldn't be ignored. To make matters more complicated, Oswy's wife, Ainflad, who was of Kentish descent and had among her household a priest from Kent, observed Easter according to the non-Celtic calculation. This, as Bede tells us, led to problems. It often happened that at that time Easter was celebrated twice in one year, and as the king, with his fasting over, was celebrating his Easter, the queen and her household, still persisting with their fasting, were observing Palm Sunday. In other words, the discrepancy between the two sets of calculations led to situations in which one part of the Northumbrian court was celebrating Easter Sunday, while the other was still feasting for Lent. Oswy's son, Aelfrith, or Alcfrith, also favoured the non-Celtic method. So Oswy decided to resolve the dispute once and for all. He called a meeting of leading church thinkers at St Hilda's Monastery at Whitby, or in Old English, Strainachel. And you'll see all sorts of spellings of the word in various sources. Now, Whitby Abbey looks very pretty in this picture, but the architecturally minded among you will realise that these are later Gothic ruins and not the remains of a Saxon building, which was already ruined by the time of the Norman Conquest. Anyway, leading the Celtic faction at Whitby was Finnan's successor, Colman. Leading his opponents was a Frankish clergyman, Agilbert, who had served as Bishop of Wessex, but he requested that another member of his party, the Northumbrian Wilfrith, who had travelled and studied on the continent, speak on his behalf. Agilbert couldn't speak English. It isn't clear in what language Colman made his case. Since Oswy had spent time with the monks of Iona and knew their language, Colman may not have had to argue in English, certainly though Wilfrith did. You'll often see Wilfrith's name changed to Wilfrid, from the Latinization Wilfridus, but in Old English it's Wilfrith, ending with the letter F. Actually, it might be more like Wilfrith than Wilfrith. F properly represents the sound in that, this, or the rather than in thing, thunder, or thistle. That sound is properly represented by the letter thorn, but Wilfrith, I think, is easier to say than Wilfrith, and at any rate, Old English manuscripts can be a bit inconsistent in how they use thorn and eth, sometimes they even seem interchangeable. Anyway, with Wilfrith, or Wilfrith, or Wilfrid, ready to speak in English for the non-Celtic party, it was time for the debate to begin. Annoyingly, B doesn't spell out the exact technicalities of the differences between the two methods of calculating Easter, and leaves us to piece this information together from the speeches. This is actually a little surprising, because Bede himself, as we'll see in part two, had a pretty strong interest in the method for determining the date of Easter. But the gist seems to be that the Celtic faction made the range of acceptable dates for celebrating Easter the 13th to the 20th moon of the first month of the Jewish lunar calendar, but their opponents had this range as the 14th to the 21st moon. Now that's all a bit of a mouthful, and we really seem to be in the realm of esoteric academic debate here. But this would have had real life consequences. Because the lunar year and the solar year have different lengths, this 13th or 14th moon of a month in a lunar calendar falls on a different date each solar year. We'll look in more depth at how this works in part two, but the upshot of this is that if this was the entirety of the difference between the two methods of calculating Easter, if the 14th moon came on a Sunday evening one year, Oswy would have celebrated Easter on that Sunday, the first Sunday after the 13th moon. But his wife, Ainflad, who had to celebrate Easter on the Sunday after the 14th moon, would have had her Easter Sunday a whole week later. Using the rules for calculating the date of Easter, which we'll look at in part two, we can work out that this had happened in 661 and was due to happen again in 668. But there may well have been other differences not fully described by Bede, which resulted in different Easter dates happening even more regularly. So, King Oswe started proceedings at the debate by stressing that they all worshipped one god and hoped for one reward by doing so. The celebration of important religious festivals, he said, should also be uniform. He asked each side to set out its position and to say what authority they were following. And at this point I judged it wisest not to attempt Irish and Northern accents for each party, so I'm afraid you'll have to make do with my boring voice throughout. Coleman was the first to speak. 
the Easter which I am accustomed to celebrate I received from my elders, who sent me here as bishop. All our fathers, men beloved of God, are known to have celebrated it in just the same way, and so that this may not seem to be contemptible or reproachable, this is the same Easter that the blessed evangelist John, a disciple especially beloved of the Lord, is said to have celebrated with all the churches over which he presided. A pretty solid start. The monks of Iona, his elders, were well respected, and he upped the ante by bringing in John, the author of the fourth canonical gospel, whom early Christians considered to be the same man as the disciple John. This line, a disciple especially beloved of the Lord, isn't just bluster, it's a reference to the phrase, the disciple whom Jesus loved, which pops up a few times in John's gospel. If Jesus liked him, and he said that having the 13th moon as a potential start of Easter celebrations was the way to go, then who could possibly disagree? Well, according to Wilfrith, quite a few people actually. The Easter which we keep, we saw celebrated by all at Rome, where the blessed apostles Peter and Paul lived, taught, died and are buried. We saw this same thing done by all in Italy and in Gaul, through which we travel for the sake of learning and prayer. We found it celebrated with a single unvarying method of timing throughout Africa, Asia, Egypt, Greece and the whole world, wherever the Church of Christ has spread throughout different nations and languages, except only these men and their accomplices in obstinacy, I mean the Picts and the Britons, when from these two islands at the edge of the ocean, and not even all of these, they fight in foolish toil against the whole world. A little harsh, perhaps. Coleman certainly thought so. It's astounding that you would wish to call our toil foolish, since in this we follow the example of so great an apostle, who is worthy of laying on the Lord's breast. After all, the whole world knows that he lived most wisely. So just in case we didn't get the message that Jesus really liked John, Coleman reminds us of John 13, 23. Now there was leaning on Jesus' bosom one of his disciples, whom Jesus loved. So Wil Wilfred had to get past this stumbling block of a popular disciple agreeing with Coleman's position. And he tried a few lines of attack. John, he said, could be forgiven for his obviously wrong celebration of Easter, because while he was spreading the new religion, the church was still much more closely influenced by Jewish practices than it would go on to be. He still performed circumcisions and offered animal sacrifices, and this was done with no other purpose than not scaring off potential converts from among the Jews. But by now, the need for a Judaized church was over, and not only was it not necessary, it was actually forbidden for Christians to be circumcised or sacrificed at the temple. John's practice of celebrating Easter on the 14th day of the first lunar month, i.e. the day after the 13th moon, in line with the Jewish Passover, could be done away with for the same reason. And actually, Wilfrith pointed out, the Celtic method wasn't even properly the one that John had used anyway, because, he claimed, John hadn't concerned himself with Sundays, but had simply begun his Easter celebration on the evening of the 14th day, whenever that was. But Wilfrith's own high-profile authority, St. Peter, when he had set himself up at Rome, remembered that Jesus has ridden from the dead on a Sunday and instructed that Easter should be celebrated on a Sunday, the first Sunday after the 14th moon. And despite Wilfrid's earlier suggestion that Christians no longer needed to concern themselves with Jewish law, he couldn't help adding that Coleman's method didn't even abide by that, because he claimed Jewish law commands that Passover, to which the date of Easter was linked, should fall between the 14th and the 21st moon. All of John's successors, he claimed, abided by this, and the Council of Nicaea confirmed the range of acceptable dates. At this point he drew together all these various strands of his attack with a big rhetorical flourish, and when he mentions the law here he means Jewish law. As a result, it is clear, Coleman, that you follow neither the example of John, as you say you do, nor that of Peter, whose tradition you knowingly contradict, and that you agree with neither the law nor the gospel in your observation of Easter. And just in case we haven't got the message yet, for John, keeping his Easter time according to the decrees of the laws of Moses, had no care for the first day after the Sabbath. You do not do this, who only celebrate Easter on the first day after the Sabbath. Peter celebrated Easter Sunday from the 15th moon to the 21st. You do not do this, who observe Easter Sunday from the 14th moon to the 20th. The consequence of this is that you very often begin Easter on the 13th moon, in the evening, of which the law made no mention, and on which the Lord, the author and giver of the gospel, did not eat the old Passover meal. This was on the 14th. Again, you completely banish the 21st moon from your celebration of your Easter, which the law has most strongly recommended for celebration. 
and again, once more for luck, and thus as I have said, in your celebration of the most important festival, you agree with neither John, nor Peter, nor the law, nor the gospel. So he's laid it on pretty thick here, whether or not everything he said is strictly true, and it looks like he was starting to get the upper hand. Coleman's response was to name some names of respectable church figures who supported his method of calculating Easter, to break up Wilfrith's assertion that the whole world was against him. He started with the 3rd century Bishop Anatolius of Laodicea, an important figure in the history of Easter calculations. Surely Anatolius, a holy man and one much praised in the work of former church historians, didn't understand things in a way contrary to the law or the gospel, he who wrote that Easter was to be celebrated from the 13th to the 20th. And in Stephen, Rip Stephen of Ripon's account, he also brings up Polycarp, who may sound like a cross between a synthesizer and a fish, but was actually an important early Christian martyr. Well, how did Wilfrith respond? It is the case that Anatolius was a most holy and most learned man, and one most worthy of praise, but what have you to do with him, since you don't follow his decrees either? Anatolius, said Wilfrith, used a 19-year cycle as part of his calculations. We'll see a 19-year cycle at work in part two, and he claimed that Coleman's faction either didn't know about this, or simply ignored it. And this here is the only real hint we get that the difference between the two methods was more complicated than just the 13th and 14th moon issue. Wilfrith added that Anatolius actually thought of moons differently from Coleman, and where Coleman had the 13th moon at the start of any given day, Anatolius had it at the end of that day. Whether any of this is the truth, or the whole truth, isn't clear, but at least according to Bede, Wilfrith was successfully detaching Coleman's position from the vast majority of mainstream Christianity. So, with Anatolius successfully batted away, if we're Coleman, we've got to turn to a more familiar figure. Surely it isn't to be believed that our most reverend father Columba and his successors, men beloved of God, who kept Easter in just the same way, understood things or acted in a way contrary to the divine scriptures. After all, there were many among them of whose sanctity there are heavenly signs, and of whose virtues the miracles which they worked provided testimony. I myself, not doubting that they are saints, never stop following their lives, customs, and doctrines. A strong finish. Columba and his followers had been the major driving force for the spread of Christianity in northern Britain, and a number of them had been saints, some even within living memory. Who could possibly speak against them? Well, as you might have guessed, Wilfrith could. About your father Columba and his followers, whose holiness you imitate, and whose doctrine and precepts, confirmed by holy signs, you hold up as an example for following, I could answer that in response to many of those who say to the Lord on the day of judgment that in his name they prophesied and cast out demons and performed many proofs of their virtue, he will reply that he has never known them. But far be it from me to say this about your fathers. After sowing these ironic seeds of doubt about Columba, he still had to do a bit more. After all, Columba was a pretty well-respected figure. I do not think that such an observance of Easter was much of a problem for them, so long as no one arrived who could show them decrees of a more perfect ordinance which they could follow. But you and your comrades, if you are dismissive of following these decrees, heard from the apostolic see, belonging to the universal church, and confirmed by the sacred writings, sin without any doubt. He now paints the early monks of Iona as having a sort of pious rustic simplicity. No one had told them of advances in Easter calculation, so they couldn't be blamed. Coleman, though, didn't have that excuse, and his persistence with the Celtic method, even after being told of the method used by the majority, wasn't just bloody-minded, it was sinful. It's actually doubtful that the rest of Christendom was as uniform as Wilfred makes out, but certainly the nature of the difference between the Celtic method and others made it an outlier. Anyway, it was time for Wilfrith's coup de grace. Even if your fathers were saints, surely the smallness of their number from one corner of the furthest island is not to be preferred to the universal church of Christ which exists throughout the world, and even if that Columba of yours, and indeed of ours, if he was a man of Christ, was holy and strong in virtues, surely he could not be preferred to the most blessed leader of the apostles, to whom the Lord said, you are the rock, and upon this rock I shall build my church, and the gates of hell shall have no strength against it, and I shall give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven. And with this proof that even God enjoys a pun, 
he wrapped up his case. In both Latin and Greek, Petra means rock, so the name Petrus, or Peter, which Jesus gave to one of the apostles named Simon, is just a masculinized form of the word. There's an element here of my apostle is better than your apostle. John the evangelist might have put his head on Jesus's breast, but Peter was actually made the bouncer of the afterlife. And it was this which seems to have settled the matter for Oswy. I say with you that he is the gatekeeper, whom I have no wish of contradicting. Instead, so far as I have knowledge and ability, I wish to obey him in all his decrees, in case, when I arrive at the doorway into the kingdom of heaven, there is no one there to unlock it. So all that wrangling over 13th and 14th moons, Sundays and 19 year cycles, and the clincher was simply, which one will get me into heaven? And this wasn't just on the king's mind either. Bede uses a nice metaphor to convey the mood of the Northumbrian people before the synod. They feared that they were running their race in vain. The promise of entry into heaven, with the non-Celtic method, meant that Coleman was defeated. And he left Lindisfarne, taking some of the relics of St Aidan with him. He was replaced as Bishop of the Northumbrians by a supporter of the non-Celtic method. Wilfrith had won, and he would later go on to become Bishop of the Northumbrians himself. Just at the very end of his account, Bede reveals that the Synod had actually also focused on a second issue, the correct form of ecclesiastical tonsure, the way in which clergymen's heads were shaved. The winning side, again the non-Celtic party, supported the familiar crown-shaped tonsure which comes to mind when you think of medieval monks. There's no indication in Bede of what the Celtic shape was, but there's an article by Daniel McCarthy which shows that a triangular shape is likely, and I put the full title and a link to the abstract in the video description. It's a real shame that we don't get any debate on this in Bede. You can just imagine. Polycarp had go faster stripes shaved into his hair. Yeah, but he only did that to attract converts. Only bold carts get past St. Peter now. Oh well. Just a quick diversion before the end of part one. We've seen that Bede wrote in Latin, but later in the Saxon period his work was translated into Old English. And although this is now a couple of steps removed from the original speeches at the Synod, it would have been nice to see Wilfrith's speeches in Old English and imagine that he might have used some of these actual words. Unfortunately, in the three manuscripts, which are entirely available online, chapter 25 of the third book of Bede's work, from which all the quotations have come, is missing, along with chapter 26, which describes Coleman leaving Northumbria. Here's the relevant bit in the three manuscripts. These are all from the 11th century, and there's one other older manuscript held by Oxford's Bodleian Library, but the relevant bit of that hasn't been scanned in and put online. Anyway, in these three manuscripts, you can see the end of chapter 24 and the start of chapter 27 in the bits on the screen. If you haven't spent much time reading Old English manuscripts, how do you know I'm telling you the truth? Well, if you look up a translation of Bede Book 3, you'll see the end of chapter 24 talking about bishops in the nation of the Mercians. Now, in the manuscripts, you can see the words on Merchner or Mirchner Theoda, which means in the people of the Mercians. And then if you look at a translation of the start of chapter 27, you'll see a mention of that eclipse which happened in 664. Now, in the manuscripts, you can see Eclipsis Solis, which is just the scribe's spelling of the Latin for eclipse of the sun. The fact that these two sections are missing in all three copies shows the difficulty of working with manuscripts. Scribes will have copied out their text from another manuscript, and any errors would be passed from copy to copy unless someone noticed. The numbering system in modern edition of Bede wouldn't have been there in the medieval copies, so this sort of error would have been pretty hard to spot. Uh, you can see in the bottom picture a Roman numeral 19, which shows that they're working with a different numbering system, not the chapters 24, 25, and so on, which would make it obvious that two were missing. Anyway, that ends our look at the Synod of Whitby. In part two, we'll look at how Easter would have been calculated in the late classical and early medieval words. See you there.